All right. Welcome back, pop culture nerds. Uh, we are wrapping up our season here. And one of the best ways we could possibly do that is by having a returning guest. If you've been a fan of the podcast for a while, you may have remembered this guest. He is a game designer, programmer, producer, and even founder of a video game design firm. Please welcome back Noah Falstein, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you. It's really good to be here. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how have you been? It's 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 almost uh, obviously it's been a little bit over a year now, but you know how how's the past year treated you? Uh, it's been good. Uh, it's actually been one of the best years I've had as a freelancer ever, which kind of was a surprise to me. But uh, coming out of COVID, a lot of people are interested in working with me, so it's been really nice. Awesome. Yeah. I, I guess I, I didn't even really consider COVID now because we're you know, obviously we're a couple of years beyond mm -hmm. the worst of it. Right. But, uh, you know, I, I noticed myself playing a lot more video games during that time period. So are you still seeing people who maybe began some uh, cycles back then? Or are they starting to, you know, get closer to their first, like new titles? Or I guess what what are you seeing from that? Well, what I'm seeing is there was clearly a boom in demand for games and uh, the uh, you know huge spate of layoffs we've had recently, most people are attributing to you know that dampening out. You know that just growth was so uh, you know impressive just for 2020, 2021 that a lot of companies hired a lot of people and it was a little bit more than they could handle. Um, but what's interesting for me is that the area I've been working in recently is games and health and um, remote health. Uh, also, you know, had a big boost during COVID. And unlike the rest of the games industry, that's actually continued. And if anything, just has gotten stronger since, you know, people have realized that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, speaking of health, that uh, it, it really it pays to be able to do um, treatment digitally with a video game instead of having to have somebody come into a doctor's office and see somebody in person. See now, that's mm -hmm. that's something that I feel like I would benefit from w w suffering from some recent back pain, as opposed mm -hmm. to trying to pull myself into a, <laughs> to get seen by a doctor. I, yeah, I would much rather just mm -hmm. do that, you know, virtually and, and not have to deal with it. <laughs> but, well, and and the you know for back pain and that sort of thing, the area that's been most promising is that uh, you probably were prescribed, you know, some exercises to do, and by its very nature, it's it's painful to do them. And you're told, okay, now bend to the left and bend to the right and repeat that 10 times and then, you know, wait, you know, 30 seconds and do it again. It's not only, you know, boring, but it's painful. On the other hand, if you're said, okay, we're ready to get you going and you've got a sort of pilot wing screen and now you're piloting a hang glider and you're, you're tilting to get it to go through a bunch of targets. Uh, the problem that they have with that for games is that people get so into the game work they're doing that they over exercise and people who couldn't do, you know, three repetitions of it are now doing 20 and maybe pushing it too hard. So, you know, a lot of really interesting recovery stuff that's going on that way. See, I, find, I can't say we didn't yeah. spend a lot of time on like uh, ring fit back during the pandemic. We were mm. Fighting over at the house because it seemed like all the well the gyms closed. It was just a really good way to you know work out when all the exercise equipment was unavailable. So you know there's been a huge rise in that too. I think because for a while you couldn't get a copy of it. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, Supernatural got bought out by uh, Meta, and they've been incorporating that into their their um, Meta Three headset. So trying to get people to do workouts in, in VR, which I enjoyed for a while during you know the pandemic, but the problem is if you really work up a good sweat and you're wearing a headset, it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> I did that very with foggy boxing, too. boxing apps that way where it was like, it took it off and I'm just like dripping with sweat. I'm sitting there wiping it off, making sure I'm not ruining the thing. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Really, really seals in the flavor yeah. that kind. Of, and, <laughs> that's, that's a fun problem if you do not wear the hand straps on your VR controllers and you're getting all sweaty and suddenly the controllers are just flying around the room, and we're we're back to the shattered flat screens of the Wii days. Mm, they yeah. just started enabling the uh, hand tracking now Ooh. though on all of them, so it's really a lot more immersive than it used to be. You see, and and this this is a great topic that that Noah, trust me, we will get to. Uh, but one thing I wanted to ask you about before that point, kind of in catching up with you, we we got to see that you went back to Paris again. You've been you've been obviously traveling quite a bit this year. 
I mean, I, of the time, how many times, I guess, have you been to Paris uh, so far in your life? Uh, well, it's funny you ask because uh, during COVID, one of the many, you know, God, how do I, you know, kill some extra time things I did was go through every international trip I've ever done and make a spreadsheet just to keep track of, of all of that. And Paris was number one on the list and counting only times I go, I, go, I went and stayed overnight, but that I also then left the city and spent time somewhere else and came back. You know, it's a sort of hard. Is it a separate trip if you go to another city and then you come back to Paris? So I decided to count that, you know, as long as I stayed overnight in another city. Uh, number is now 27. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. I just, wow. I, you know, very typical, stereotypical uh, American falling in love with Paris. And I just kept looking for opportunities of people who wanted me to speak there or uh, companies I could work for, and, you know, went on vacation a few times. And uh, it's just, you know, I, at this point, I know it better than Chicago, where I grew up or San Francisco, where I hardly ever get into, you know, anymore. So he said, what he said was he was asking if... Uh... Alfred sees you across the way in a table with uh, Anne Hathaway drinking at Ferner Branca when he's, you know. Uh... Well, I, I can't answer that because my wife might watch this video and I, I just don't want her to know about, you know, the whole Anne thing, you know, just, you know, let's keep that down. I, you, uh, do you make your way down to Monte Carlo or Algiers while you're there? You know, Not this time, uh, but there was a, a conference uh, called – I think it was Imagina was the one that was in Monaco and uh, it was pretty amazing. You know, it was actually not a great conference, but everybody went just because of the setting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very cool. Uh, see, and, and Nate, Nate knows that life because his company will send him on these trips just to go to a location. And, and Nate painfully goes, he, he calls me up and tells me how hard it is to have to stay at an expensive lodge for business. But, you know, I guess she's kind of that, that Jackson Hole trip and that Park City trip. Those were all business. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, 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 Noah. Obviously, we don't want to blow up your spot with Anne Hathaway here. But one thing we do want to ask you about, since we couldn't really talk about it a year ago, would actually be revisiting Monkey Island because it mm. it it wasn't quite out yet the last time we mm -hmm. talked with you, and really wanted to get. I guess first off, get get your opinion based off of maybe how much you've played. I mean, have you, have you gotten through the whole title yet? Yeah. So I, I got to do alpha testing on it. And um, the funny thing is I played through the entire game um, in its early version where a lot of the animations and graphics were just, um, you know, still hand-drawn pictures with a little note about what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And since it's been done, you know, they gave me a copy and I played uh, through the, the intro again, but I just keep meaning to go back and do it again. I also went and played the end of the game several times because it has a variety of different endings, and I just was super impressed by the way they handled that. So we, we can delve into that a bit. But, yeah, I have played through the whole thing. Um, I think I played through it when I last saw you, but I just was still under embargo about saying much mm -hmm. besides the fact that I liked it. And um, I will say, you know, it was difficult – as a tester in that I just had so much trouble finding fault with it or things that I really would like to see different. And I thought I'm just, you know, playing it too easy on them, but I've been delighted to see that most of the reviews have been, you know, pretty much in sync with how I felt about it, that there are aspects of it, particularly about, you know, Ron, Ron is always controversial about his, his game endings and, uh, I know it would kind of shock me that there were some people that were still pretty negative about this one. But in fact, I just think it was a masterpiece, not just of gameplay, but of, uh, you know, the, the art and science of interactive storytelling. I and mean, he just gets into these deep questions about what is the nature of a story and does it change depending on who tells it or who's listening to it. And, you know, all of that worked into a pure entertainment thing, you know, just I totally blown away by it. And I still, you know, at this point, I think it is absolutely the state of the art in what, you know, one of the old style graphic adventures can be with another 30 years of experience and uh, attention and a great team making it. Did you have a favorite ending of those? Cause I, my favorite was the one where he dies and you go back to the bench and there's nobody there. Like I said, that was. I, 
I didn't try that one. Actually, I heard it. I saw a list online and uh, I, I guess that would have been too traumatizing for me. Um, no, I mean, I think the thing that I like the best and that I, I have not been able to talk about it in 30 years, but now Ron has been really explicit, is that I was literally one of probably three people um, besides Ron who he had confided in about the original secret of Monkey Island and when he made that game, what the secret was. And originally that was supposed to be uh, a theme park, very much a Westworld kind of thing before, you know, the, the TV series came out of that guy brush, all the anachronisms you see in the game were meant to be intentional. And then when you suddenly find out, you know, a guy brush is exploring and is finding these strange things. And turns out there was a whole set of tunnels underneath the landscape he was in and all the stuff he was seeing was, was uh, mechanical Disney kinds of stuff. And that was partly inspired by, you know, the secret, of the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean ride that, you know, was heavily uh, influencing it. But he's he's finally admitted that that's really what was behind it from the beginning. That's why it, there was a secret. And uh, that certainly is explored a lot, you know, throughout the endings, particularly as you sort of shut down things and um, in Melee Island. So I, I'm. I've, I've obviously been a fan of Monkey Island for a very long time and, you know, playing the, you know, the second game and then curse as well. And those themes of the, you know, the carnival rides and everything, you always kind of asked yourself, especially with the ending of two, like, what am I actually, what, like, what is this setting actually about? And it, it felt like for a little bit there because of um, maybe some of the, the production transferring from different creators may have lost a little bit of that and 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 to kind of see that come back uh that yeah. that was it was the right kind of gut punch i'll put it that way so well so and i, I won't get into this in too much depth I, I keep thinking i should write a um an article about the sort of philosophy of interactive storytelling that it gets into but just to give you a sense of why i think it's actually profound is you know people would complain that the ending was very much like the, oh, it was just a dream after all. And it just felt like it had cheapened it because it wasn't real. It was just a theme park. And, you know, sometimes I want to, you know, when people say that, I always want to shake them and say, wait a minute, this is a video game. It's not real even in the first place. And there are multiple levels of it not being real. And in fact, every single person has their, who plays it, just like people who you know watch a movie or, or read a book, they have their own interpretation of it. But of course, with, with games, you have a totally unique pathway you take through it as well. So it's very individualized. And the whole stuff he does with Guybrush and Boybrush and that whole bit really kind of brings in this idea of the nature of storytelling and how it depends on who's telling you the story and what the person wants to hear and how upset they are when it's not going the way they want to. And the fact that that's a commentary by Ron and Dave on how people reacted to the Monkey 2 ending, that I think the very people who didn't get it then, will it'll go completely over their heads. So at any rate, I just think it was fascinating that he did all that, unlike some people who would really hit you over the head with it and say, oh, I'm going to teach you an important lesson. It's just part of the game. And yes, some people don't like it, but I just thought it was great that you could enjoy the game and essentially the ending adapted to whatever it was that you thought was the best way for it to end by the, the way that you actually chose to play the game. I just all, all in all, I mean, it just, it was a fun game. The puzzles were well designed. You know, the, the thing I was looking for as a tester was puzzles that were either too hard or too obvious. And boy, this game, it just tuned stuff so well. There were one or two things I found that I thought were a little bit counterintuitive. And the the main one involving uh, pufferfish, Ron said, oh yeah, we, we realized that and we, we added a little hint earlier on so it's clearer. And it's like, it just I, I really couldn't improve it at all with uh, the comments I made. I thought it was interesting in the game that what I read from it a little bit was you could tell that Ron was at a different point in his life yeah. in, in this one versus the last one. And I'm sure I don't know everything about his personal life, but it seemed like you could tell he's much older, much different. Maybe he has, I don't know if he's been a father or not since that point, but it just seemed like he knew most likely who was going to play the game and really enjoy it. Those people that had really enjoyed the series. And that really sp I know, spoke to Mark and I a lot about that, that I'm um, in a storytelling way. He let the story evolve with 
the people that played it originally too. Like it was, yeah. I'm missing a way it was there for us. Uh, and so I thought, yeah, that was well, and, and Dave Grossman, who, who did a lot of the writing, it was also interesting because I worked with, uh, with them enough and with Tim for that matter, that I could tell who wrote certain pieces of it sometimes just from the style or, or the, the humor involved. And uh, Dave is, is a dad. Uh, his son is, what, about eight or nine now, I think. And he's been quoted as saying that one of the hardest things was to work on this game for a couple of years. And his son, who was intensely interested in whatever he was doing, he just couldn't even tell him what was going on because he, he was sure he would end up inadvertently or not leaking it to his friends. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, both of them have had some degree of parenting experience. You know, it's a little more um, fresh for Dave. And I think that that was part of what they wanted to say in, in the game itself. Now, Noah, with, with how successful you think this game was, and I, I, I agree with you too, I think there's a lot to be said um, over more than just the ending of a story, uh, because even though it may have been a dream, everything along the way kind of added up to an adventure. Um, now, with how well Monkey Island went, can you do you have any thoughts on any other previous titles or franchises you'd like to see come back? Um, kind of in the same vein. Wow. Um, well, I mean, just because of the work I've done, um, I've had a lot of people who want, uh, you know, Hal and I work on a, a more direct sequel to Fate of Atlantis, and, and that's never going to happen, unfortunately. But uh, um, I would say for myself, um, I think one of our most misunderstood games was Loom. And I think Loom was in many ways a casual adventure game, which today is kind of a genre. And back then, if you didn't get your 20 to 40 hours and, you know, with an emphasis more on the 40, then people would go up in arms and, and yell at you. And we, we got a lot of hate mail from Loom because of exactly that. They loved the game and it was over too soon. And, and you know, you cheated us and we want a refund. And, mm. um, and one or two people, a grandmother in Las Vegas sent in this wonderful letter saying how much she enjoyed it. And she tried a game before that her, her grandkids had made her play and it was just too confusing and hard, but loom, she could understand, got through to the end. It was very beautiful and lyrical and classical music. And um, I think the indie developers now understand taking chances like that. And, and um, Brian had uh, drafted two sequels, you know, I had a trilogy in mind and, for a while, the sequel Forge was underway, uh, not from Brian, but by some other guys in, in, at LucasArts. And um, wouldn't mind seeing a, a modern treatment on that. You know, even the interface that was music, uh, I think, would be fun to see. Well, um, tell you what, how about we, we shift gears for a moment? Because I, I know that obviously a lot of your fans are going to ask those Indiana Jones questions. And... Similar to last time, we were just on the doorstep of really learning more about the Dial of Destiny, you know, the, the future of, of the Indiana Jones franchise. And I'm happy that you, you brought up a question that we were going to kind of get to, because in, in the same vein of revisiting a franchise, we've seen Final Fantasy VII get a remake and a lot of people came back to that property. Now, in, in your mind, Noah, would, would the... I guess, would the next story after Fate of Atlantis be interesting to you or would you, I guess, be equally as interested in seeing it get remastered at this point? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, the the lazy side of me would just much prefer it being remastered and you know done lovingly. Uh, and it is a shame that it hasn't gotten that treatment given that so many of the others have. But And, and that actually, I think, is quite possible that... Uh, particularly as Disney and um, uh, Craig, uh, Craig Derrick in particular, who's kind of been responsible for a lot of this is um, he really believes in the old stuff uh, and not just return to monkey Island, but the um, sea of thieves uh, monkey Island stuff. Apparently that went very well. And I think there's a, a good chance that we'll see um, more remasters and hopefully fate of Atlantis will be one of those. Um, so, I'll see where that goes, but uh, I don't have a burning desire to continue that story, frankly. Um, in fact, Hal did to a degree with um, his uh, Infernal Machine game. He brought Sophia back, and Sophia is, you know, as a character had really been his invention to begin with, so it you know, certainly made sense. Um, 
but yeah, on Indiana Jones, it was fun to play in that world. And I, I'm the only one who got a chance to do, you know, the, those two early games that way, you know, and Hal did, did his two, but um, I, I kind of had enough of that. Um, I, I'm really happy to move on to other challenges, other stories. Yeah, it, it's to me, I, I, I love seeing properties that like Ghostbusters, mm -hmm. for example, that got got kind of some life you know, pump back into it because then some of the older fans, I, I consider myself an older fan of, of Indiana Jones and, and some of these properties at this point, but it's, it's fun to see what people who may not have been big fans have to say about it at that point. Mm -hmm. And when I bring up fate of Atlantis to maybe other fans or, you know, other fellow nerds, whatever it may be, there's always this, this such high level of regard for those titles. And it's pretty clear to me that nostalgia hasn't hasn't died. I mean, the, the nostalgia is very oh, strong. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, this whole podcast is basically nostalgia. But I mean, you could even look at like how much fun it would bring. Uh, I think like the modern generation uh, with this style of game because uh, take imagine like I know at least uh, two out of the three um, hosts of this podcast currently uh, will be downloading Super Mario RPG as it's been redone and made all pretty now. <laughs> so could you? I, Oh, there we go. Three out of three <laughs> have, have the new Super Mario RPG. So I think something like that would be great for Fate of Atlantis over giving it like a, like a graphics overhaul, even though the old, the old, uh, I was like not eight bit, but that was what? 24, 16 bit. The old, old Fate of Atlantis somewhere in there. Yeah. Give well, I mean, a, it, it, most of our games here. had, had multiple versions of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I, I wouldn't mind that. And, you know, even with the old version of it, there are many fans who approach me now who, when I say, you know, you were like five years old when that came out. And sometimes it's because an older sibling played it or they had a version, you know, they inherited a computer that was 10 years old and played it on that. But quite frequently now I meet people who just played an emulator version, you know, weren't even born when the game came out. And, uh, are a big fan, you know, that and, and Sinistar, my arcade game from 1982, that's, you know, had its 40th birthday now. Um, I, I meet a lot of people, uh, you know, who weren't born, you know, in one case, somebody who's got a tattoo of Sinistar on her foot. So you know, <laughs> definitely uh, hardcore fans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's fun. That's great. I, I, I guess to, uh, to build off of this, getting back to what we talked about a few moments ago with VR. Now, I feel like VR is one of those those mediums right now that may not have like the widespread appeal of every generation of gaming that comes out, right? I mean, I, when the PS5 debuted, Nate got one right away. I couldn't get my hands on one, <laughs> but I but I he 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 hooked me up eventually. But the point I was getting to was that I I don't think I've seen that same style of maybe hype behind VR. Obviously, you're a lot closer to it with its applications to different, you know, different industries. But I guess, do, do you see VR as a trend growing at this point? Or have we already kind of hit, you know, maybe a plateau waiting to do something different? Uh, well, I definitely see growth. You know, the new headsets are very promising, uh, you know, as, as um, who was it? I guess Joe was mentioning the fact that they've got hand tracking and um, some of the new ones do or will have eye tracking and I got to play with that on several different types of headsets. They're all very expensive ones right now. But that was amazing. In fact, for storytelling, I saw a demo, it was a good 10 years ago, of an eye tracking headset where they had done a very simple, um, very adventure game-ish kind of thing using eye tracking. That was one of the most kind of chilling and emotionally involving moments I've had playing a game. Um, you know, you're actually being interrogated by somebody and uh, they're they're trying to get you to implicate one of your uh, friends as a co-conspirator. And this is a, a terrorist who you feel is going to kill them. And he starts laying these pictures out on the table. And I know that it's eye tracking and I know it's a demo. So I think I'm not going to look at the picture. And the person running the demo, you know, over my shoulder says, try looking at the coffee mug. And I thought, oh, well, that sounds pretty innocent. So I look at the coffee mug on the desk and the guy leans over, smashes the coffee mug out of my sight and says, you look at me. 
And it was one of the scariest things that ever happened to me in a game because I suddenly felt I'm there, he sees me, and I'm in big trouble now. It was when I, I went from playing a demo to suddenly feeling like I was captured by a terrorist. And um, I, I now the downside is as soon as I saw that, I, I said, you know, this is one of the most unpleasant demos I've ever seen. It was very impressive, but you're not going to make people a fan by scaring the crap out of them. So um any rate, uh, that's a, a moot point. I do think that VR, I think XR in particular has uh, a huge future um, in many, many ways. I, I really expect that uh, in another, oh, as soon as two to three years from now, the uh, AR glasses that are starting to come out will become much more popular. Um, just from my experience wearing Google Glass uh, 10 years ago, despite its unpopularity, those of us who were using it loved it in a lot of ways. You know, it's something I still miss to this day. Anyway, I, I do yeah. think that VR is establishing itself. Um, there's a lot of entertainment that hasn't really been uh, approached very well. Um, there's a VR movie called Pearl that was actually nominated for an Oscar as a short subject, regardless of the fact that it was VR. And that also, I think, is much more compelling because it's VR than it would have been if it was just a regular flat screen. So I think there's a lot that can be done with that. I think the biggest problem so far with VR is that the experiences just aren't long enough mm -hmm. for an adventure game. That one's the longest I'd ever played, and it lasted, you know, three or four hours, which was pretty heavy in VR um, for one sitting. Yeah, that actually is a problem is that, you know, even if they did last longer, I'm not sure most people would tolerate it. Uh, I played the um, A Fisherman's Tale. I haven't played the sequel yet. Yes, but, yes, Fisherman's um, Tale. That, that was fun. That was fun. It was it was fairly short. It was clever. It really used what VR could do that, you know, you can't do anywhere else. The, the final puzzles were kind of mind bending, but I, I appreciated the fact that they they were trying to use the medium as best they could to make a really unique type of puzzle. And it was really interesting, multiple layers of watching yourself try to do something. And Oh you know, yeah. Launching your head game. around and like moving pieces around. And then uh, the whole thing, you know, it's like storytelling too. Same kind of idea. It was, uh, I played through that one too. Yeah. Yeah. So Noah, with, with all this talk of VR we're doing and uh, clearly like, you had mentioned that maybe AR may be more of the future for gaming. Uh, how did you even get your start into learning about VR? And how have you continued to develop your knowledge in it? Well, I, you know, I saw some of the very earliest VR. In fact, the, the term itself was coined by a guy named Jaron Lanier. And in 1985, I think, he came by uh, Lucasfilm uh, to give us a talk. Uh, Chip Morningstar, who was our, our technical guru, uh, knew everybody doing interesting stuff at that point, and he invited him to give a demo. And he had just gotten uh, the cover of Scientific American with this uh, company he had that was not even doing VR, but it had a glove that was the very first thing where you could actually use the glove to interact with the world. And he it's called VPL was his company. It stood for visual programming language because his idea was to have this symbolic visual language for programming. And then to control it, you'd put on this glove and, you know, sort of move symbols around, which is, you know, kind of commonplace now, but was in 84, it was just shocking. And what was interesting is that he thought that the language itself was the interesting thing. And every time he would demo it, everybody was just staring at the glove and not paying attention to what was going on <laughs> on the screen because it was so fascinating that it felt like he was reaching into the, the virtual world. And so he went on to do some of the early VR work. And I got very disillusioned because it was, you know, very low frame rate, low resolution mm -hmm. in the 80s and 90s. And, you know, when the um, Palmer Lucky thing came around in, what was that, 20... 11 or 2012 somewhere around there um the first i heard about is oh yeah vr you know that's that's nowhere near it and then i actually saw a demo of um the early vive uh, vr headset and i was just like so many people totally blown away that wow the technology's finally gotten to the point where it's actually working well and now we're even farther down the curve and that's you know part of my belief is you could just see it getting better and better and it's 
a little bit like um, the old Apple Newton that was uh, a you know handheld thing that you could use to take notes and stuff, but it was just awkward and the technology wasn't good enough and uh, it turned a lot of people off so that when they said, oh, we're going to make a whole phone that has a little screen, a lot of people said, oh, yeah, we saw that on the Newton. It's what a waste of time. This iPhone thing's going to be a total flop. And I think we're kind of at that inflection point now where we're going to see some types of headsets, you know, and they're, they're just very different for different types of uses. So I think we'll see specialized ones that work really well for gaming and others that are more for business use uh, or training use, you know, and, and we've seen Microsoft kind of go for the enterprise training market with HoloLens. Um, and yeah, and they're, they're sending a VR headset set up to, um, the space station to test uh, using it for uh, meditation and anxiety issues, uh, which is another thing that it's proven to be really good at. Uh, I just, I, I, you, you mentioned this, this glove of 84 doing wonders in front of an entire audience. And all I can imagine is a very, very young version of yourself being upset at a power glove, not doing at all what I was hoping it would do. So I'm glad that something <laughs> glove like worked back then. You yeah, well, I mean, granted, up. these were, you know, demos that the guy was doing with one piece of hardware. It was a prototype that probably cost, you know, 10,000 bucks in, in 1984 dollars. So, Do you know what kind of VR that you said you're sending up a relaxation and meditation apps to the space station? Is that like a th MetaQuest 3 they're doing that on or is that? I think so. I mean, it's, you can look it up. It was in the news just a, a week or two ago. Um, uh yeah, sorry, I don't remember the the details, but I'm you just look up VR and space station, it'll I'm sure it'll pop up first. I, I'm almost jealous of them getting it because I feel like just in general, this type of technology I think would have been, you know, absolutely amazing to have during early COVID when so many of us were isolated and, you know, kind of cordoned off for each other. So it's like this kind of stuff I could really see having immediate applications. But I guess kind of in the theme, Noah, of what we've been asking you tonight. If, if resources weren't really a problem, is there a mm -hmm. video game or a property that you would like to explore in VR? And it doesn't have to be Indiana Jones related, by the way. We're not trying to, <laughs> we're not trying to back you into a wall here. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's okay. Actually, I, I've got a kind of uh, premeditated answer because it's a game that I've been, I actually proposed uh, to Lucasfilm Games, you know, in the 80s and realized that the technology wasn't there yet. Um, but it's a concept that I call um, I call the the uh, concept of science of magic, um, and in, in before Harry Potter, you know, there's the idea of um, a school for magicians. But the way that you would cast spells, it wasn't like you pick them off a list or all the sort of RPG stuff we, you have. You literally had to learn how to make the right set types of gestures or to say the right things in the right order with the right intonation. And I was thinking that there was a world, I, I did some world building of, you know, one group that does gestural magic, another one that does dance magic where they have to move their whole bodies, uh, another one that does rune magic so that it's a matter of spelling things out. And that would be a lot more like what's been done in, in games already. But in particular, I liked the idea that if you reduced it to kind of a science of a cause and effect, then when you're casting a spell, if you cast it wrong, it will do something wrong, but it will do something predictably wrong. So if you tell it to cast fireball, but if the word for fire and glue turn out to be very similar, you might be casting a glue ball and mm -hmm. you might discover new things just by experimenting. But of course, as it would happen with real magic, be a very dangerous thing to just, you know, cast spells and not knowing what might happen. And with uh, particularly the hand tracking and soon the eye tracking, but already the analysis of people's voice and body movement. So much of that would be possible now that wasn't really possible then. I, I was kind of faking it with mouse gestures and stuff, but uh, you wouldn't have to fake it now. And the Achilles heel of all that is I spent some time trying to work out the the science behind this magic. You know, And like many people started with a earth, air, fire, and water thing and was building from there. And I'm convinced there's something possible there, but um, it would take a really good team of people to brainstorm exactly how to make that work. Uh, so uh, the, the latest Pixar movie, Elemental, 
brought it to mind because they're another, you know, earth, air, fire, water thing. And that, that was such a, seemed like such an intuitive way to people 2000 years ago to separate out the different states of matter that I'd love to, to make a game about that. So I was going to ask then, does J.K. Rowling have access to your notes in any way? Because that's that, that's incredible to me <laughs> that you had that idea. <coughs> you know, like how, how well, long I mean, before Harry Potter would you have had that idea? It was quite a while. But I mean, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin had the, um, the um, what was it, the Riddle Master series or was that, maybe I'm mixing them up now. But she, she wrote a, a series of books about a, a magic school. Um, very different in nature from the Harry Potter thing. Uh, and so, yeah, I don't think it's, I mean, I'm sure that if you look deeper into literature, it probably goes back, you know, 50 years or more, but uh, you know, I, I'm, I have no, I, one of the things that I've learned over and over again, in fact, I had to testify in a lawsuit about this is that anytime it seems like somebody stole an idea um, it is amazing how many times different people get an almost identical idea around the same time or implement different ideas so that they look the same. And I mean, we see it over and over again. I mean, there are many years where there have been two or even three movies that came out that looked like they were all on exactly the same theme. Mm -hmm. And it just happened mm -hmm. to be that people wrote them at that time. Uh, when I was doing arcade games, we had a game that we were calling Food Fight. And this was not long after... Um, uh, the uh, John Belushi uh, Animal House movie came out where there's a big food fight in it. So it wasn't too surprising that other people came up with it. But I think three companies, uh, Atari, Williams, and and one of the others, maybe Bally, all had games that involved throwing food at each other. Um, and ours ended up being called Splat and was not very successful. And Atari actually had the rights to the name Food Fight, um, mm -hmm. but neither of them really took off. But anyway, that kind of thing of saying, oh, yeah, this would make a great game or a great you know, story or whatever. It just it does happen simultaneously everywhere. Now, on that topic of trends um, and you seeing how like companies will be kind of doing the same things each other based off of what they think the market's interested in. Now, I think a lot of us here and a lot of our listeners grew up with things like Math Blaster and the Oregon Trail and Carmen San Diego, And it just seemed like there were a lot of businesses, a lot of different companies trying to make their way into gaming and education, kind of working together. Do you see any other trends uh, being transformative or like that over the next like half a decade to a decade or so? Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Roblox and Minecraft both have very strong directions of teaching people. I mean, it's interesting for Minecraft, whenever, you know, for the last five years or more, whatever it's been, if somebody says, yeah, my 10 year old is really interested in programming now. I says, oh, he's into Minecraft, isn't he? And how did you know that? It just, it's amazing how many kids are um, setting up their own servers, you know, at the age of 11, um, just because Minecraft is, is so compelling to them. And Roblox, uh, I know a guy there who's the head of their educational uh, um, division and they have a lot of stuff in the fire, you know, irons in the fire. And I, I think um, we're going to see more and more of that. I, I've done enough educational stuff to know that it's really, really challenging. You know, the fact that there have only been a handful like Oregon Trail and Carmen San Diego and a few others that have actually stood the test of time and, and people keep coming back to them. Uh, it's hard to do, but I have seen some very promising directions and there's a, a new company uh, in the UK that I, I've consulted for a little bit that's doing a really interesting math-based educational thing. Um, you know, just on this theme of science fiction too, in uh, the um, Neil Stevenson book, uh, The Diamond Age, he has this thing that before there was an iPad, he wrote this story about this thing in the future where you have this thing that's kind of like an iPad with, you know, full voice and great pictures and, and in his idea, there are people whose jobs it is to be, uh, they call them, I think, vectors, virtual actors, to embody characters. You know, you basically wealthy people hire them to work with, you know, essentially be a virtual nanny for their kids and teach them through this virtual interface. And um, the, the disturbing parts of that aside, I, I think it's a fascinating idea. And 
Um, I don't think we're going to get people being hired to do that, but we seem to be on the verge of having AI that might end up doing that with possibly even more disturbing uh, consequences, but it does seem like things are moving that way. Mm -hmm. it, it's something that's always been top of mind for me because I feel like at least our generation has been able to get to see these large movements within education, whether it's going from having no computers in a classroom to suddenly having, you know, a massive dedicated room for it. And then it, for me, it was even kind of, uh, uh, I, I don't know, maybe a rude awakening to see that a classroom is now full of tablets that kindergartners are even using. And, yeah. you know, so uh, part of me wants to know if, if, I guess, if you think, would is VR going to possibly have that kind of place in schools? Because we've seen applications in like the, the medical field. We've seen, um, as you mentioned, some of these commercial uses there. So I, I guess from, for me, I'm wondering, do you think VR is going to enter, you know, maybe younger education as opposed to, you know, more collegiate level? I think it has the potential there. And in particular in countries or areas where, uh, people can't afford to go into school and if the school can come to them uh, and have it, you know, even for that matter, have uh, one person be effectively teaching a large number of kids, you know, hundreds or thousands of kids because of uh, aid by, by AI and, and technology. I see that as being potentially, you know, game changing, <laughs> excuse the expression. Um, <laughs> however, one of the things that led me into doing games for health instead of educational games is that um, elementary school teachers have been one of the staunchest opponents of games for education because they have seen for years games as the enemy. That's what the kids are doing when they're not studying, when they're pretending to, to be looking at their books, but they've really got, you know, a, you know, a Game Boy or, or equivalent and hidden behind their, their book. And um, that's why I think there's been much more successful in, in professional training and college or master's level stuff, because th at that point, the people are there really to learn and not because they're being sent there by their parents and they'd rather be somewhere else playing a video game. Um, so that's a, a tough one to get around. Uh, I do think that eventually there'll be enough quality learning games out there this is like, like you said, Carmen San Diego and um, Oregon Trail in particular were pretty freely adopted by teachers, you know, even when they were brand new way back when. Um, and there is a realization that if you can, I mean, interactive learning, it's not a panacea. It's not going to be great at every possible thing. It's not great for rote memorization, for example. Um, but for understanding systems, I don't think there's anything better than a video game. And uh, maybe VR, maybe not, but VR, um, I mean, VR in classrooms, I don't think will be as likely as VR at home so that you can join classrooms remotely. I think it has a little bit more to do with how easy it is to wear those mm -hmm. things, because I know that's mm -hmm. been the biggest thing I can't get. I couldn't get Mark to wear a MetaQuest 2. And so trying, you know, if you think about something like some of the, the, the end reels now they're coming out with it are more like glasses. Um, I think that the closer you can get to that experience, the more likely you are to find. Well, that's why I was pushing AR because um, with Google Glass, it had a tiny screen. It was very low resolution. In fact, it was kind of like Commodore 64 resolution. So I found that very familiar. But it was specifically above your line of sight. It didn't, you know, mm -hmm. occlude what you were looking at. And that was a really smart decision because you could just look at people face to face, get eye contact. But it would uh, one of the simple things it would do is that it would mirror your phone notifications. So you'd see that pop up. And on that that screen and a lot of the ones out there are like that now, it was difficult to see that there was anything coming through from the outside. It's perfectly visible when you're wearing it. But somebody looking at you just sees a little glimmer of light and they don't know what's going on. And it was a little bit like having, you know, ESP that I'd, I'd be in a meeting with my friends and um, I'd say, you know, well, this is great, but uh, my guest just arrived at the lobby. I need to get going. And I hadn't taken the phone out of my pocket. I hadn't looked at my watch or anything else. Uh, and it, I, it, there was something really marvelous about being able to glance and within a, a fraction of a second, see 
oh, that's nothing, or oh, that's an important call, I've got to take it, and go back to looking someone in the eye. And uh, there's many times where people had no idea that I was receiving other information that way. Um, and with AR glasses hooked up to um, the internet and to AIs that are listening to you and you know whispering in your ear, or giving you information on you're at a meeting and it's, it's telling you who this person is and you met them three years ago and they have a son named you know uh, Jack and uh, he's five years old now. And it lets you say, oh, how's Jack doing? He must be getting into school now. And people are so happy that you remember. And of course, by then, everyone will know how it is that you know that, but uh, uh, it's just going to open up a whole different level of being able to interact with people, much like, you know, we, we can look up anything, you know, we can Google any kind of information and you can't do that without sort of stopping and obviously doing that. But when it's kind of being pumped into your vision, just listening in to what you're hearing or seeing what you're looking at. And here's where the eye tracking comes in. If they can tell that you're looking at something and you look away and it says, oh, you know, that's actually written in Polish and here's what it means. And it's basically mm -hmm. translating and I just so many kind of wonderful, magical things that I think are going to be possible that way. And really, the technology is there right now. It's just a matter of, you know, it's like uh, William Gibson would say, it's just not evenly distributed yet. So you have a few people in laboratories able to do these miraculous things. And uh, hopefully in just a few more years, it will be in the hands of, of, you know, hundreds of thousands and then millions of us in the public. Microsoft was starting to do that with... Alt space VR, you would speak in your native tongue and it would automatically translate into several languages they had set up for that in, in kind of a captions. It yeah. was really, really interesting. Like you could, it was almost like the universal translator. Now we're getting closer and closer to that sort of thing. It's, it's fascinating. I, I feel like I have to say one thing here on the topic of VR because Nate mentioned it. This is a size eight hat that I'm wearing right now. So that's really my biggest aversion to VR. Is it is it going to be big enough for this large head that I own? Um, that's that's really the only the only drawback I have. <laughs> you know, uh, the I think the the MetaQuest three has the interocular distance adjustment built into it, so you can actually you know adjust it for yourself, which. Um, is is not quite what you're asking. They all have something where you can kind of clamp it to your head in different ways. The main thing, you know, again, Google Glass was so light, you know, you wore it all day and it was you know, no heavier than a, a, a sort of thick pair of sunglasses. So I had no problem wearing it. Mm -hmm. I would not want to wear most of the current headsets uh, for more than a few hours at a time. But that's just, you know, like everything else, it's just going to get lighter and faster. So I think we'll be seeing that. And also big enough for big heads. I, I also have a fairly large head and my, my two grandkids to my, my daughter's dismay, all both were in like the 98th or 99th percentile for head size when they were born. So, so I'm with you on that. It's, it's a good, good place to be. It really is. <laughs> <laughs> but tell you what, Noah, we, we really do uh, appreciate getting the chance to sit down with you again here. It's, it's really, I know I, I mentioned this the first time. It's, it's an absolute privilege to be able to sit down with you, learn from you, as well as ask about some of the, the games you created that have impacted all of us. Um, so you really do have, uh, obviously, our appreciation. And you've survived a digital dissection once again. So we, uh, we just want to know if there's anything you'd like to share with our listeners, um, kind of like we did last time, if there's anything you'd like them to know. Uh, no, I mean, you guys do a great job of, of covering all this in a, a very easy, interesting way. You know, you're, you're not asking me the, the same questions that I've answered on, you know, 20 other podcasts before, and I really appreciate that. Um, and uh, yeah, you always make me think about stuff. I haven't been thinking about that science and magic thing for a while. Um, but no, I mean, I think, uh, thanks. I think you guys do a great job and, uh, you know, always happy to, to jump in. If I do something significant in the future that uh, you might want to cover, then I'm happy to talk about that too. I'm Noah Falstein, and until next time, keep on dissecting. Dissecting.